Assalamu alaikum and dear Alimadad everyone from the Hibara. Eid is coming, spring is here. It's a wonderful, uh, it's wonderful to see all of you uh, for this uh, book launch today. Um, I was so delighted when uh, in one of my early meetings with uh, Umar, he brought me a uh, hot off the press copy of the emergence of uh, um, she Sufism, and I thought, okay, this is why we do what we do, right, is to be able to make these connections. So I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome all of you to the Institute of Ismaili Studies uh, this afternoon and uh, to celebrate a noteworthy work uh, with some very distinguished panelists who are going to be in conversation uh, with uh, Professor Alessandro for uh, a discussion of uh, his book. And uh, I look forward to the conversation. I know that Professor Walid Saleh, who uh, uh, is a, a good friend and highly respected, uh, is joining us uh, online, I believe, uh, from Toronto. So welcome, Professor Saleh, as well. And uh, what can I say? Look forward to a great conversation. And please don't be. Uh, um, insulted, I have another meeting, so I'll stay for about half an hour and then I'll leave. And it, <laughs> by no means, any disrespect, but uh, I hope that uh, uh, it will be recorded and I'll be able to watch the rest of the conversation later. So I leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zain Kassam. Professor Zain Kassam has been director of the IAS for 100 days today. So congratulations. <laughs> um, this is a new era for the IAS. And uh, I thank you for being with us. Um, thank you for those attending in person and those attending online. I am told that there are about 100 people connecting online. So uh, we have about less than 30 in the room. Um, but I do have a message for those connecting online, which is that if you do come to London, please come to the Aga Khan Center. Uh, in, today we are in a, in a different room. We would have normally been in a conference room, but today we are in the Crown Room, which is a very privileged place. We are surrounded by the Garden of Life, the Garden of Light, and the Terrace of Discovery. What else do you want? So please come to the Aga Khan Center when you come to London. Especially if it's a sunny day. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce our panelists. Um, and it is a celebration. We are celebrating the publication of the emergence of uh, Xi Sufism by Alessandro Kanchan. And we have two uh, speakers, um, very distinguished professors who are very prolific and extremely well versed in the fields, uh, we have Professor Sajjad Ridley from the University of Exeter, and Professor Walid Saleh, who has been mentioned from the University of Toronto, connecting remotely. Uh, before I uh, sit down and, interview and start the conversation, um, I would like to thank our partners, Oxford University Press, for their support and for being there uh, with us to publish the Quranic study series. This is the 21st volume in the series, um, and I invite uh, everyone to check the OUP uh, website and the IIS website as well, where you will find information on, on all the books that we've, that we've published so far. I would also thank, like to thank the contribution uh, of those who have made this book possible, uh, among them our editors, uh, Eleanor, Eleanor Payton, uh, Lisa Morgan, and uh, Patricia Salazar, who have worked tirelessly on preparing this book for publication. And also I would like to thank Tara Wolnau, who is here with us for facilitating and making all, everything possible. So thank you very, very much. And thank you also to uh, uh, Dr. Fahad Daftari, who has been director of the IS for many years, who was also very, very supportive about this project. Um, I would like to, begin by throwing some questions in the air, okay? So the first, um, first issue about this book and, and the topic that it covers 
um, is that it deals with two uh, very uh, grand traditions within Islam, the Shi'i tradition and the Sufi tradition. And one of my questions to Dr. Ganshan is, how do these traditions come together? Do these traditions come together at points or they separate at other points? What is the, the history and how do you cover this in your book? Um, another point that I have is a bit more methodological or more perhaps it's a, it's a problematic that we have in Islamic studies, which is that um, we have people who are devoted to, for lack of a better word, classical texts or classical authors and other people who focus more on the contemporary period. And there's this almost divide. Um, and yet your book, uh, Alessandro, um, covers a period in the late 18th century, which almost bridges between the classical and the contemporary. And I would also like you to talk about this and, and the other panelists as well. Um, and similarly, uh, equally uh, thinking about methodologies and the, pro the problems that we have in this field, um, is that sometimes, uh, this is a perception that I, that I have, uh, is that sometimes we have this artificial fragmentation uh, of specialization. Uh, there is people who specialize in uh, Iran, Iranologists who go to Ira uh, Iran-related uh, conferences, those people who specialize on Quranic commentaries, those people who specialize in Sufism, and more or less branch out to other fields. But is there something to be said about these various fields that seem to be coming together in, in this book, which tackles a number of, uh, which deals with all of these complex people, these various fields. Um, finally, I would like, because we are the history of my studies, I'd like to make a small connection, which is, which is found in the book uh, as well, which is between the long-standing relationship between the Ismailis and Sufism, um, and specifically uh, the relationship between the Ismailis and the Matullahi order, which goes back centuries. Um, but if you ask any Ismaili to tell you the name of their Imams, they will be able to do that. And the last Imams, the names of the last Imams, or the latest Imams, uh, sound like Shah Ali Shah, Sultan Muhammad Shah. And the name of our author today that we are discussing is Sultan Ali Shah. So these are names that have a connection to Tariqa, but also to the Shi'i and the Iranian um, uh, uh, events that happened during the Qajar uh, period. Right? So lots of things happening in this book. Right? Um, so if I, if I can open the discussion by asking uh, the author, Alessandro Kanchan, to tell us a bit about uh, the book, but more specifically about the author, about the uh, the object of the book, Sultan al Shakonabadi, who is he? What does he come from? What is his place in Islamic intellectual history? Okay, um, thank you very much, Ola, for the introduction, for the prompts. Uh, uh, so, maybe a lot of things uh, that's been thrown in for discussion. Um, so, um, yeah, let me start uh, uh, precisely from who uh, Sultan Ali Shah is, because that will give me an opportunity to uh, to address your uh, question about fragmentation and the uh, multiple audiences that uh, uh, this book appeals uh, to and, and, and talks to. Uh, Sultan, I think that the reason why there is such a uh, wide range of uh, uh, audiences is uh, um, partly uh, due to Sultan Ali Shah himself. So he was a very um, multifaceted personality. Uh, he, was, he was, of course, a Sufi. That would be his first. Uh, uh, identity, if you want, uh, but he was also a uh, committed 12 she. Uh, he was a philosopher. Uh, he studied with the uh, with, uh, uh, Hadith of Zavari, who was uh, the foremost uh, uh, philosopher of the Qajar time. 
who was sort of a superstar when he, he if, you, if you read uh, uh, Sultan Alisha's biography, uh, there are reports of him uh, after having studied the, uh, the Madrasa, the Hausa Aimea, what today we, we say Hausa the Madrasa curriculum. Uh, so Arabic, Fiqh, Usul, uh, up to the level of Ishtihad, uh, he uh, hears about the fame of uh, this guy in Sabzavar, this scholar in Sabzavar, who is a uh, who is known to be a a, uh, a sage, a um, uh, a great philosopher, and he travels all the way to Sabzavar to study with him. So there is uh, this aspect to. Uh, he was one of Sabzavari's uh, uh, pupils, um, and um, and yeah, so he was a multifaceted personality. And all of these uh, streams uh, of uh, the intellectual history of twelve uh, Shiism, of Shiism and Sufism, I would say, yeah, I wouldn't restrict uh, his uh, his legacy to twelve Shiism or Sufism. But there, there, there's a number of streams uh, of intellectual history that conflate. Uh, in all of his uh, voluminous work, uh, because we don't only have the Tafsir, we have uh, a number of works. The Tafsir is uh, the only uh, work written by him in Arabic, except another, another small work. But he, he writes in Persian mainly. Uh, but all of these streams conflate uh, in, the, uh, in his Quran commentary. Uh, but particularly in his Quran If I can go back to the issue of Shi Islam and yeah. Sufi Islam. Two large traditions. You call the book the emergence of Shi's Shi Sufism. Now, these two traditions have been in contact, haven't they, for centuries? Why? How does this happen? And why do you call this book the emergence of Shi Sufism? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it. Uh, so much of this issue uh, boils down to how you look at things, how you look at these traditions how you define them, how you set boundaries between them, and not only between them, but between those traditions, other traditions. The very fact that we, we're talking about uh, two traditions uh, is already uh, a step towards uh, uh, us defining them. Uh, I had very recently the opportunity, I finished uh, the chapter of the uh, Oxford Handbook for, uh, for uh, uh, today. <laughs> and that gave me an opportunity, that, that gave me an opportunity uh, to reflect further on this uh, issue of uh, uh, boundaries, uh, confessional identity, uh, blurred lines between uh, Shiism and Sufism. Um, I think that ultimately, uh, why I uh, decided to call it the emergence of Shi Sufism is because for the first time in history, despite uh, uh, having a lot of uh, uh, Sufis who have uh, Shi proclivities or they are even Shia, um, twelve Shi is. Uh, uh, affiliated to this or that uh, Sufi order. It is probably the first time in history that we have uh, a uh, committedly 12 uh, Shi'i and committedly Sufi order. So Sultan Ali Shah is uh, the master of uh, or the eponymous master of the Gonobodi uh, branch of the Matullahiyah. And uh, uh, it is at this point that the Sufi order, of course, exists. It's an Nimatullah here, right? It, 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 it exists uh, centuries before. Uh, it dates back centuries before. Um, but it is, it is after the coming back of the Nimatullah masters uh, to Iran in the late 18th century uh, and the consolidation of the Nimatullah uh, tradition in Iran, in, in Tajar Iran. Then we have this phenomenon. It, it is it is a way I would say, uh, and in that the book talks to the uh, uh, history of religions. Uh, can you show? Can yeah. you show us? You have some images in, in the book. Um, if you can place for us where Gonabad is. I don't. Um, we need we need to, we need the clicker to be be active. Uh, if you can show us the map of Iran and show us where Gonabad is with respect to other cities and other regions, yeah. 
And then you also have a picture of uh, Sultan Ali Shah himself, yeah. uh, which is uh, important to, to view the, the, the kind of physical aspect. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you also, uh, we can also you display, can you can draw a map, yeah. you can display a, um, uh, the chain, the silsila that connects yeah. the Sufi master to the to the to Ali and the Prophet ultimately. Yeah, because uh, this is also important because uh, we need boundaries, we need uh, definition, we we, we need uh, uh, lines, uh, uh, defining lines to talk about things. But of course, uh, uh, the ah, here's the map. Yes. Ah, here's, no, this uh, no, uh, is yeah, here's the map. Yeah, here's the map. Uh, Gunabad is the, uh, on the top right, uh, is near Mashhad, is in the heart of Khorasan. Um, so, uh, uh, an area very rich in uh, mystical tradition and intellectual tradition. Yeah, the grown up here with yeah, Nishapun and tools. Yeah, you can see uh, the border cities of Sadzaba, where Sultan Alisha studied. Uh, with uh, Hani Sabzavani and um, so for those yeah. people out there who may not be specialists, you can see we don't have the modern borders. I mean, contemporary borders between like countries, but we do have vague regions. You can see Iran, Afghanistan, and uh, that would be kind of Central Asian countries. There, that, that kind of mountain and very rich historically yeah. rich region, right? Yeah, and um, and then the Silsila, if we can move the uh, uh, yeah, yes. that's the Silsila. That's how uh, what this is uh, something growing in the uh, second half of the twentieth century. It's the model. You see the modern masters of the same order, uh, Sultan Ali Shah uh, uh, was a master of, and the self. Uh, representation of uh, uh, the line of masters uh, goes back to Prophet Muhammad and Ali and the 12 Imam. Then there is a complex uh, uh, way in which uh, the uh, 12 uh, Shi'i Sufis uh, uh, solve the problem of uh, uh, having a hidden Imam uh, and at the same time a, a supreme master at Utb. Uh, who is uh, uh, the uh, ultimate reference for the uh, for the spiritual authority? Who is in Shiism, obviously in twelve Shiism, the twelve Imam. So there is a complex matter. Uh, it, 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 there is a complex uh, answer to this uh, to this uh, apparently uh, unsolvable issue. Uh, yeah, this is Gonabot. This is the, the, the shrine uh, where Sultan Ali Shah is, uh, um, uh, is buried, uh, which is now a major center of uh, uh, pilgrimage for the, uh, for the Gonabodi Sufis. And here you can see uh, Sultan Ali Shah uh, himself in his, uh, uh, in his religious attire, uh, uh, so to say. Okay, so uh, a couple more yeah. questions. So, uh, Professor um, Rizvi, um, we talk about the Qajar period. Sultan Ali Shah Gonabadi dies in, in 1909. Yeah. Um, he is part and parcel of the Qajar intellectual history. Now, he's a Sufi and he's part of the ulama. But there is, isn't there, a, a, a relationship, a tumultuous relationship between the rise of Shiism. Uh, in Iranian history, the antagonism of the ulama towards Shiism and the relationship to power. How, how does Sultan Shah Gulabadi feature in all of this complex history? Complex question. Uh, like the, the classic, you know, what's the relationship between Sufi and Shi? Um, one, one clear, the important aspect of, and this is why Emergence is a great title, um, is that in the period just before, so in the early Qajar period, the pre qajar period, there's a lot of um, contestation happening around authority. And you have some very famous attacks on Sufis. Um, the uh, famously uh, at the forefront of that. Uh, and it's not just happening, happening actually in Iran and Khorasan, it's also happening in North India. In the Shi'i media, there's a very famous kind of debate between, uh, say, the Dalali of Uthran Mahab and some of the Jishti Sufis in Plakhnoe. At the same time, uh, using very similar kinds of arguments back and forth. So there's this 
um, this idea that you know you call yourself Sufis, why do you call yourself Sufis? And I think one of the things which was happening before is that when we had Sufis who were Shi'i or Shi'i who were Shi'i who were Sufi, um, they didn't put the two together. They only put the two together as a response to the critique. So it becomes a defensive mechanism to say, yes, we are Shi'i Sufis. You know, it's it's about both at the same time to to combat this idea that um, you know being a Sufi is inauthentic from the Shi'i tradition. So that's one aspect of it. I think what's really important with the spirit. The other thing um, in terms of the emergence is that, you know, people have talked about this. Uh, the, the middle of the Fajr 19th century is, is the, the moment of the millennium. It's the millennium of the, um, the occultation of Iran. Right? And so there's lots of expectations of what's going to happen. And a number of different movements emerge which present themselves at least as a renewal or a new kind of religious dispensation, right? Whether they define themselves at the heart of the Torah Shi'i tradition or not. So, you know, you have the Shafi'is who emerge, who have a particular conception of how uh, you understand philosophy, how you understand a relationship with the Imam in this kind of imaginal realm. So it's not a, um, a straightforward expectation of his return in the physical now, but it's it's kind of a relationship with him in this medium realm of in between the uh, you know, sort of spiritual and the material. Um, and then from that, you get the Barbies and eventually the Baha'is emerging. You, of course, get the Arafans revolt and the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the transformation of the Ismaili community in that period. Um, and you do have a, a lot of torment within. Um, within uh, Sufi circles as well. Um, so I think a number of the internal um, splits in the name of the Lai order have a lot to do with this fundamental question about what is the nature of the faith? What is Walaya? How does it relate to power? And also how does it relate to modernity? Because there are some branches who kind of embrace modernity in its totality, right? Even changing dress, etc. cetera. Um, interestingly, of course, what becomes the Gunabadi uh, branch embraces what is now recognizing the clerical God. Right? Um, but in the 18th century, of course, you know, these things were emerging. Um, there wasn't a strict uniform in the same way. Um, but I think in the 17th or 18th century, if you pointed out, here's a bad region, here is a mullah, you could see the difference in the way they were dressed. And that begins, uh, begins to, uh, to kind of coalesce. Um, with the Guna particular and with with uh, Sultan Islam especially. So I think I think there's there's these sorts of, of developments which are going the question of modernity, the question of power and the splits and the, the millennial moment. So I think these are all really important for for the emergence of that. And and part of that millennium in terms of see part of the, the millennial moment is precisely this thing of okay so what is the Quran, what is the Hadith? And, and one, not only do you have, I think, quite a serious revival of interest in Tafsir in this period, and this is across the period, you know, you've got the Bab writing a Tafsir, you've got, um, you know, uh, the high scriptures, which are kind of Quran, Tafsir like as well. Um, you've got the Sheikhis extensively interested in, in Tafsir. Yeah, the Safi Ali Shah. Of course, and, and Safi Ali Shah. Yeah. So there's, there's a great interest in this precisely because it's question of okay, if we're interested in the relationship with Walai and with the Imam, how is the Imam manifest? Well, immediately the Imam is present in, in the course of the shrines, but also with the text, uh, with the Hadith, and with the Quran uh, and, and, and what it will reveal. So that's why you need this process of Tipsi to bring that out. And at the same time, you have uh, a revived interest in philosophical and kind of Irfan mystical uh, commentaries on hadith as well in the spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, now, for most of Shi'a history, philosophical and, and mystical commentaries have been fairly rare. In the 19th century, they just take off in like a massive, massive way. There's some elements of them in some of the but in the 19th century, they become huge. And and we can't even begin to understand what the seminary is up to in the present. You know, why people like Allah and the Stafsi become important? Why is Tabatabai's writings about 
the spiritual part becoming important. Why do people engage with someone like Jabari or Holi in a particular way? Unless you understand what's happening in that time period. And that's why Sultan Bishar is far more important than just among Sufis. I think he's absolutely critical to understanding how the seminary deals with the question of mysticism. Thanks for that. Thank you. So, a lot to unpack there. You've mentioned Tafsir, so I'd like to connect uh, with Professor uh, Walid Saleh. Uh, hello. But... Hello, Walid. So I, I can't seem to uh, to open my camera here. So I, I'd like to show you my face, but I can't do it. We can see you and your dog, and, I think. Yeah, but that's that's not me. I don't know how. Uh, anyway. But, um, Either Sultan Alisha or you and your dog. No. So uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I really want to say how honored I am to join you, even if virtually. and. Uh, if Professor Kasim, the new director, has left, uh, it's okay. But if she's still there, I want to say congratulations. We're really thrilled for her new tenure, and I, um, I, I mean, I'm I'm absolutely uh, thrilled for for her new directorship. The second point I really want to say is that, you know, this book is part of a group of productions that the IIS continue to put out. And really, it really is uh, just amazing. Um, like like the, the scholarship, the quality, and uh, the, the timeliness of uh, these works uh, continue to do. So, so I want to con congratulate the IIS for this work. OK, so oh, please keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, uh, Alessandro, thank you for inviting me, and uh, uh, I'm I'm really honored to be here. Um, I have like a few like uh, access points to to raise uh, of the work, and I really want your um, uh, like uh, input. Let me see if you can see me still. Let me see. No, I still can't show you myself. So, uh, the the first point I really want to come to is. Uh, like to me, I uh, uh, I work on Sunni tafsir, right? I mean, I I try to read everything that comes out on Shia tafsir, but I really work mainly on on Sunni tafsir. But what I find really a fund fundamental contribution of this work is that it really puts the significance of commentary and specifically Quran commentary at the center of like. The, the modernity issue, the, the like the modern, like what I want to say is suddenly commentating on the Quran becomes one of the major modes of Islamic developments in ways that was not the case before the 18th, 19th century. And this with this book now coming out, it's it's a phenomenon across the board, right? Um, Sunnism, Shiism, Ibadism. Right, like you know, the, one of the major Ibadi works start getting published late 19th century, early 20th century. So we're seeing it in all Islamic denominations, but also in in Islamic uh, religious movement, which is uh, Sufism or, uh, and uh, like you know the, the the other movements that are not uh, necessarily sectarian. So this is one one aspect uh, of the work, like putting the book on the map is to me a fundamental contribution, but also mm -hmm. connect, connecting commentary to, to revitalization and transformation is significant. Now, the second point that I wanna, like in a sense, I know that this, a big chunk of the work is about Shia Sufism. But actually, I'm, I'm, I really, the parts that I absolutely enjoyed about the book is the Shiaism of the Quran. In a sense, um, uh, like, the the comment that this, Alessandro shows us in in how like you, you know the Quran is a Shia work and the Quran when you, when like when one read uh, when read as such gives us a different presentation and that to me is profound really the profound the and uh, I'm I'm really talking about chapter let me see chapter four is it no chapter eight a Shia Sufi tafsir right. Um, Oh, now I can start my video. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so, so chapter eight to me is like, uh, I think it's 
smack in the middle of the book, right? Is really it becomes the heart of the book, and it starts with the famous three. Is it three four? Yeah, three seven. Sorry, three seven. The muhkamat and mutashabihat, um, and uh, like like it's this framing. It's this absolute, like in a sense, the framing that happens with such an approach, like really transforms how to read the Quran. In a sense, the muhkamat becomes the imams, right? Uh, and the mutashabihat is their enemy. So, the, so this is really, it sets the frame. And then the major uh, Shia fundamental, like the wilaya. And then now what, what is fascinating about the wilaya is that it's a term fundamental both in Shiaism and Sufism. And you could see how, how this like uh, being wrought together, like, you know, being uh, like uh, braided together that, that I find fascinating. Now, uh, what I want to ask Alessandro is like, in what way do you see this book a continuation of Shia tafsirs? And in what ways it becomes really starts to depart in its own new Shiaism, if one can say that. Like, could, could you really elaborate on that point? Um, thank you, Walid, for the um, comments and uh, for the question. <laughs> well, more than a continuation, uh, I would say um, I, I see my book as a uh, missing block uh, in. Uh, in uh, the uh, yeah, in works on tafsir, uh, because as as soon as I uh, got my hands on this tafsir, and that was almost twenty years ago, uh, and I started reading through it, uh, I realized that uh, well, this is something you know. There's a lot of such a rich work. It's such a unique work in a way, because I was. Uh, uh, discussing that with Omar earlier. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is a very classical tafsir in a way, uh, in its concerns, uh, um, in its uh, uh, audience, uh, the people uh, he talks to. Uh, so he basically talks to the seminary people, to the Hausa people. Um, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't have any, uh, at least it doesn't seem to have any contemporary concern. And that is the time where, uh, you know, modernist and reformist uh, uh, exegesis start to start to be popular. Uh, it is the time where, uh, so late uh, 19th century, when uh, Iran has already gotten in touch with uh, uh, Western uh, political, social, philosophical, and religious ideas. Uh, and you know, one proof of, of, of this is that uh, one of the branches of the Nimatullahia at the time morphs into a, uh, a sort of um, Masonic lodge. Uh, Safiya Ali Sharia becomes the Anjumani Hovat. Uh, there's nothing about that in the English steps here. Uh, so it's very classical in a way, but it's very unique. Because despite being uh, written in a yeah in a genealogical in, in a number of genealog genealogical traditions, uh, uh, it is really uh, like an, no any other uh, tafsir uh, because of the style it's written in, because of the structure of the work, uh, uh, because it covers the whole Quran. Uh, not one single word is left out. Uh, but in a very uh, original way, it's written like as a treatise. Uh, so the sometimes, most of the times, and you can see that in the book from the, uh, I have uh, re translated and reported the uh, the subheadings used in the edition, uh, and you can see that it's you, you can read it as a treatise, which is very rare of uh, of uh, of a uh, classical uh, Quranic commentary. Um, he sometimes uh, uses uh, a single word of a verse to develop the whole uh, topic, to treat the whole topic. Walaya or uh, I don't know, uh, whatever, any other any other uh, topic that he deals with. 
So, uh, and getting back to your question, I wondered at the time why uh, this stuff here is uh, hardly mentioned in you know general service of uh, uh, Tafsir of uh, the history of, of Tafsir. Sometimes it's mentioned very, like in passing, very quickly uh, or dismissively. Uh, and I said, well, that's something that you know must be amended. Uh, and yeah. I wanted to uh, bring back uh, Professor Rizvi um, and ask you about so um, one of the contributions in your book, which is, I think, uh, quite uh, well known, is that you have translated the, the introduction to the Tafsir. Uh, as well as given us, you, you have given us the table of contents, which is useful to approach such a kind of large work. But I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Risby about the um, the not necessarily the influence of the work, but the life that the that the tafsir of Sultan Ali Shah has taken, and after he passed away, right? So has it been influential? Has it been used by? By intellectuals, by Sufis, has it has has it got a public life? Um, we know that um, uh, it has been since at yeah, the beginning of the Iranian Revolution there was some public uh, 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 engagement with it. Um, how, how do you see the the afterlife? If you if we, if we can, if I may, of 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 this stuff, see, is it uh, relevant? Can it be read? Uh, uh, or is it something which is a museum piece? Is, is there a contemporary relevance to it? Um, I guess it's the question of what you think is contemporary, right? Um, I mean, it to be, as, as Sandra said, the style is wonderful. I mean, it is really good Arabic. Um, it is very good Arabic of um, a certain taste, right? Um, and um, I mean, in terms of his impact, uh, the most obvious impact is on Khomeini. And this, of course, becomes controversial because of the more recent, um, you know, persecution of the Gunabadi Zadi uh, Um Khomeini clearly loved it. And it wasn't the only work of Sultan Nishar, because I mean, I, I, I personally think Sultan Nishar's Udalaik Nama has a massive impact on Khomeini and on his conception of spiritual hierarchies and so forth, which then he leads into the politics of that time as well. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, his his son, Mustafa from many words, which you mentioned, of course, in the book, a tafsir, a partial tafsir, um, which is quite explicit on, on, on citing the prayer. Um, I think if, if people purely looked at the question of commentary from a of the circle of scholars, they would say, so Dhani Shah's tafsir is uh, of a particular type which really starts with Mullah Sahib. Uh, possibly going back to say but on the road. But we have these particular kinds of tafsir where they're much more concerned about questions of hermeneutics and the question of how does this text relate to reality? You know, what does it reveal of reality? And how does our understanding of reality and philosophy then help us to make sense of what we have seen as right? And that's something which is, is deeply in Mamasana. And mo a lot of those themes come up. So if you actually compare um, the Bayan with Mamasana's tafsir on, on the same bits, you'll find similar kinds of debates and similar kinds of discussions. And that is not continuous actually with most sort of mainstream um, Shia tafsir, which tends to be you know, classic kind of um, atomistic commentary where you're interested in how do you read this text, the text, what does it mean, what sort of kind of kalam discussions can we have over it, what does it mean for uh, the way that you analyze language and so forth, right? Um, what does it mean for uh, for certain kinds of uh, moral precepts? Uh, but the interest of Mullah Sadhu to Sultan is quite different. And then that then emerges in some later tafasi. So you find glimpses of it in Talatabai's al -Mizan. Even though I think al -Mizan very rarely cites the Bayani. Um, I don't think he ever explicitly cites it, but there's places where you suspect that he is taking it from the Bayan. Mm -hmm. um, and officially in the introduction, he actually attacks it. 
because he has this rather strange introduction where he says, you know, you shouldn't be imposing your own philosophical and mystical schemes on the Quran, but you should allow the Quran to speak for itself. And and for him, at least, uh, you know, in letter, um, the Bayan is an example of imposing a particular scheme on the Quran. Uh, so there is that scholarly um, uh, reception. There is that central figure of Khomeini. And I think we still haven't, you know, he's such a big figure in modern Iran that you can't kind of avoid the pick for many, but we still haven't got a really good idea of what his intellectual formation is. You know, we, we know kind of superficial things like who he studied with and what he mentions in some of his texts, but, you know, Sultan Nisha is one of the big influences who is, is basically unknown um, in, in that. Uh, there are other kinds of uh, influence on there as well. Um, uh, and yeah, I think for the problem, as we know, in the last few years, is because of the persecution of the Bruno Um, I don't know how easy it is to, to find a copy of the Bayan in Iran, um, or, you know, how people see the publication of it. I think people on the whole are generally quite open to things being published, all sorts of things get published in Iran. In fact, everything gets translated. Um, you know, sort of even think of Chopra, which we get translated. Um, but you know, uh, it would be interesting to look at at how you know the actual reception of the, the text being available. How is that seen uh, beyond the Nagorno circles and uh, beyond just the uh, the Hausa? Because I think in the Hausa, people would be interested in these sorts of things, but you know, beyond that. So, Alessandro, Professor Ritchie had mentioned the, the, the you know, accessing copy, etc. So, I wanted to, to, to bring us back to, to your personal experience. How did you, you mentioned that you studied 20 years ago, and I wanted to ask you to, to give us a little bit of a, of a personal journey, your personal journey on, you know, how you got your hands in this, I mean, you know, you're interested in, in the topic, your personal involvement in, in, the, in the subject. Well, um, it's very straightforward. I was working on, uh, you know, totally something else. Uh, I was in Iran, uh, uh, it was 2000, and I think it was 2001. I was finishing my PhD dissertation on the uh, Jose Elier. Uh, and I had friends. Uh, well, well, one in particular, uh, the Dr. Sharon Pazuki of the uh, Anjaman Hikmat of uh, in Tehran, who presented me with a copy of, uh, of uh, the Bayon. And uh, he suggested me that, suggested that I, that I uh, work on that in the future, and I'm uh, working on something else, but that I so kind of put it aside. And kind of, I wrote an article, I think, in 2008. Uh, uh, about a you know, specific uh, uh, aspect of the, of the Bayon. And then, you know, I started working on it when I came here and I found the uh, ideal uh, place because I was encouraged to, to, to work on that. So I think uh, you guys saw the potential of, uh, of, of the work. Um, yeah, that's mm, basically, it was a gift. Uh, and it was the, the four volumes were a gift and I, can I ask you something perhaps even a bit more personal? Yeah. Which is how 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 is it to work from an intellectual point of view on a work and on a Sufi order to which you will also relate, uh, 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 you know, not only as an observer. Um, what is that kind of personal uh, element, personal attachment? Well, and, and, and also scholarly detachment. I think that uh, whenever you work uh, on uh, a single author, uh, you, in a way, uh, you know, uh, whether you want it or not, establish a relationship with this with, with this individual. And I try to, uh, I, I mentioned that in the, in the preface of the book, I, I um, I try to enter the uh, yeah the spiritual world of Sultan Ali Shah, his mind, and trying to see uh, things as, as he would have seen them. Uh, so, okay. So, um, 
we'll go back to Professor Saleh and then we open the questions and I'm going to pick up the tablet because I think we may have also some questions uh, online. So, um, Walid, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Ah, yes, yes, yes. So I wanted to ask you something about um, Alessandro has translated the introduction of the tafsir. Now that translation was is difficult because the the style is it's rhetorical, but it's also deep. It's also you know dealing with difficult aspects, etc. Now I wanted to ask you from the point of view of a person who deals with tafsirs and the importance of reading the introduction to a tafsir. Right, you would think that um, I don't know. I don't know. But sometimes, uh, you know, uh, when we 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 have uh, classes on on Quran and Tafsir, Quranic interpretation, and we we tell students about uh, the importance of Tafsirs and the importance of inter of introductions, um, it is very easy to kind of um, miss the importance of of these introductions. So I wanted to ask you, uh, mm -hmm. uh, since you have had access to reading this book. Even before it was published, um, what is your take on the importance of this, uh, of this, in, the introduction to this tafsir and also Alessandro's translation of it? So I actually, you, you really, uh, this is um, people would think that you were really, you and I have coordinated our questions, but oh, I'm yeah. sure no. But <laughs> like, I really want to, like, also that the other major point I wanted to point out is the monographic nature of this. Like, this is. This is a real book in the sense that this is the result of 20 years of working. And this is an introduction to an intellectual tradition, to Sufism in, in its Iranian Shia context, and to Quran commentary uh, on the eve of modernity in like, you know, in Shia circles, uh, intellectual circles. So like, the, in a sense the there's, such richness to the book that I really want to take this moment to congratulate Alessandro uh, on this. Uh, like, I mean, you know, uh, like, you know, writing books is never easy, but writing books of like this heft is impossible. You just have to look at the the, the sources. Like, the, uh, you know, uh, one of the first thing I do in a book is I really look at the bibliography. Um, just and it's just like unbelievable and i really this is the, this is a work that is a primer in on very many levels uh, now also is is the is that like to take the trouble to put an appendix that is like um, what, almost 40 pages right it's a it's quite an introduction yeah um yeah it's almost uh, with with some uh, is actually what you want because you want a taste of the thing itself. Uh, so like this is, um, so in addition to the substance of uh, discussing certain um, uh, surahs and verses in the body of the Quran, now we have the introduction. Now, I actually think introductions are not all the same, like some introductions are better than others. So that's, uh, uh, but when an introduction is significant, it becomes really fundamental. And I think this is one of those. And I think, now I do wanna say that um, it, it, it has the, the, the taste of, uh, of scholastic Shiism like coming out of profound house and learning. And I think that really comes through through the introduction. In a sense, what you don't sense here is a discontinuity. And that's what I find profound in a sense, uh, 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 Sultan Ali Shah is, 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 is deeply connected to the tradition. Through him, the tradition has not yet experienced a rupture. And to me, that's uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the profundity of translating the introduction. Uh, yeah. Oh, and then um, uh, it's uh, beautifully written. Uh, uh, I do have a question to Alessandro. Now, yeah. Did I read that it was translated into Persian? Yes, it was translated. There is a 10 volumes uh, Persian translation. Okay, that's really to go back to my colleague uh, Shazad. Um, um, uh, Sajad, Sajad, like 
in a sense, so what, what is the significance of this translation then to, to the Iranian reception uh, in general? Like, why would, it, why would it be translated if it's not like have an environment or was it just translated simply like in a, in a, in a localized situation? Both of you. Uh, okay, man. Yeah. Um, so okay, the impact. So the reason why. Okay, uh, let me put it like that. There must be a uh, an underground uh, history of the reception of uh, of this uh, by Uh Many scholars, uh, exegetes, uh, uh, jurists. Uh, Definitely read it uh, throughout this, uh, you know, throughout this uh, century and more than one century uh, from its reduction. Uh, and sometimes it has uh, instances of uh, re-emergence. Sometimes someone uh, actually mentions it, uh, uh, whether in uh, in the writings or in the case in the case of Khomeini in his. Uh, uh, Televised uh, um, uh, commentary to the Quran that was interrupted. Partly, it's rumored because uh, uh, he mentioned uh, Sultan Ali Shah and Ibn Arabi. Oh, this is it's impossible to prove, but uh, uh, so the translation. I think that the, the uh, I think it's been it's been done uh, uh, some 20, 25 years ago. The Persian translation, maybe less. Uh, it's clearly, uh, to me at least, uh, I haven't looked uh, uh, in depth uh, into that, but I think it's uh, for the use of uh, of the uh, people of the of the Sicilia, uh who don't don't read read Arabic. So it's uh, uh, it's been done to put at their disposal uh, the uh, one of the main works of uh, uh, the master. Uh, but there's been other instances of partial translation throughout the years, uh, and others, one of the master uh, had translated uh, bits of it, you know, some, some, uh, some parts of, it, of, of the tafsir. Um, and, and that is more to do uh, with uh, a matter of uh, authority problem, probably establishing uh, the you know, spiritual authority of the Sufi master. Uh, so it's complex. It would be really interesting to uh, have something more solid about the reception of the and 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 the uh, extent of circulation of this tafsir within the house. That would be very interesting. But my impression is that uh, you know everyone knew it uh, at least, if not everyone read it, which is not possibly the case. But it was. It is something that is. Uh, uh, that is in the air. Can you tell us um, that Sultan Ali Shah was, was accused of plagiarism? Yeah. At point, but those, these accusations have been withdrawn. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because that's interesting. Uh, well, they've been proven totally wrong. Also, because th 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 there are so many different versions of uh, how he plagiarized and who he plagiarized. Someone said, uh, oh, he found a manuscript uh, in Isfahan. He copied it, put his name on No, he just took it, put his name on, on it. Uh, Someone has said uh, uh, this is a copy for uh, uh, from uh, Mahaini's uh, commentary. Someone has said uh, oh, this is just plagiarism of Sabzavari's ideas and put it into tafsir form and so on and so forth. And famously, Ogamboso of Tehrani uh, mentioned that uh, this is probably not his work. So we don't have uh, the evidence of uh, uh, Ogamboso uh, recanting. We only have some uh, oral reports of. Uh, People going to South Sudan and asking him about uh, the Tafsir Bayan Sarah. I said, Yeah, I was wrong uh, in the in the in the Zaria. I was wrong. Uh, it, it's Sultan Ali Shah's work. Yeah. So uh, we uh, we can open uh, for questions. Um, We've been in uh, bombarded by thousands of questions. No, I'm joking. I'm, I'm inviting questions from uh, uh, which are not technical. The, the presentation will be will be available online. So before you ask, yes, will be on YouTube, I guess. YouTube channel. Um, 
there is a there is a question online before we open uh, to the floor. Unless if you want to raise your hands for for questions, okay. We have two questions. If I may uh, start with one online, um, could you speak about why um, you refer to this uh, phenomenon as? This is a question that I have asked you for many years. Uh, she is Shiism and not Sufi Shiism. Is there a reason? No, I don't know. It sounds better. <laughs> I don't really have an answer. And that's why you keep asking me the question. Yeah. I don't know. But if the person who asked this question has a, a, you know, something that is really bothering you, maybe you can tell us with the calling something she, she is Sufism. I mean, yeah, Sufi Shiism. If, if, if I, if I if I was to say, uh, what is that? Uh, yes, the book is. I remind you. Yeah, yeah no, I know. But yeah. if if I if I if I say uh, yeah. Sufi Shiism, uh, to me it sounds like uh, I don't know uh, some sort of uh, Mullah Sadra -ish thing. You know, it, it it doesn't it doesn't give the idea of uh, it doesn't give the sense of. Uh, the Sufi Tariqa, which is she. So I don't know. Yeah, it makes sense. I think I, I'm, I'm, you know, thinking loud because I, 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 really, I really don't have a question. Okay. It just sounds better. It sounds more appropriate. No, you would have thought that in 20 years you would have thought about this question for <laughs> uh, We have a question here and then over there. Okay, so the obvious one for the expired is. The Ismaili Nizari Imam's connection with uh, with the Niyamatullahi Sufi, and I wanted to know if you found out anything more than what we already know. I was intrigued by one of the statements that you made in your book, and I was one of those lucky ones who managed to read this before the book was published. So I wanted to check whether the sentence made to the final version and it has. <laughs> it says, um, so it, you are talking about Aga Khan the first, and you say that uh, he. He was associated with Niyamatullah Sufism, as his name suggests. Now, what is in the name that suggests that he was a Niyamatullah? Well, the Ali Shah. I mean, it's not it's not a, 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 an exclusive feature of the Niyamatullah. Uh, but there are. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I think it's highly possible. Even today, the the the, the uh, uh, look at that time as if uh, it's paradoxical. Uh, mm -hmm. It is problematic, but probably it's problematic from our modern, uh, very uh, Aristotelian way of looking at uh, the religious phenomenon. We, we, we like to put boundaries uh, uh, without probably uh, uh, saying, yeah, wait, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't that relevant in the 19th century uh you could have uh, an ismaili imam who was also initiated to uh, a sufi order so yeah okay we had another question yeah. yeah my question would be about the origin of shi sufi interaction and the history do you know what is like the first valid historical documents that we know about the sufi shi or shi sufi interaction uh, that also, that's a big question. Uh, that also is, uh, uh, is, a, is a question that uh, who's the, the answer to which uh, uh, needs to change uh, as we change the point of view. So uh, from the point of view of, uh, uh, say, a contemporary Shi Sufi. Uh, so the first interaction is uh, at the origin of, uh, of uh, is with within uh, Prophet Muhammad or with, with Ali, with Ali, yeah, uh, with Imam Ali, um, because they see no difference between uh, Shiism and Sufism. They are essentially the same thing. This is an essentially uh, uh, approach to that. Uh, uh, well, the first interaction, we know that uh, uh, the imams, uh, some of the imams, uh, before being the Shi imams, uh, had uh, uh, connections with uh, the so-called, you know, the, the, we can say founding fathers of Sufi, where Hassan al-Basri is, uh, is one. It's very difficult because the sources are uh, 
uh, uh, very few. It's not easy to say. Plus, it's not my, you know, my, my exactly my 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 specialism. But uh, yeah, it really depends on maybe maybe Sajad could. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, into that. I think the problem is how you understand what is historical. I mean, I would have said Alastair Belovico. You know, <laughs> that's that's you know one of the the things about Alastair Belovico is about Valer. And so, if you ask the Sufi, you know, where does this go back to? He says, "This is preternal. This is not uh, something in 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 the kind of current space and time." Um, when it when it comes to um, and then of course you've got um, you've got lots of different types of interactions. I mean, you've got um, in in Shia these sources you have these famous conversations between um, Gomer ibn Ziyad and Imam Ali. Which then become foundational for later Sufis, whether they're Shi Sufis or whether they're Sunni Sufis. Um, and then you have all sorts of spiritual practices. So, for example, if I ask you a simple question, what is the first historical evidence we have for Nadi Ali? I don't know. Right? But it's absolutely at the core of Shi and Sufi practice. Uh, for example, if you look at the Shishtis of South Asia, who don't identify themselves as she. Now the idea is one of the most important um, words that they have. Um, it's part of their spiritual practice in exactly the same form as it's used by, by she communities. Um, and then of course, at the same time, you have lots of historical sources about hostility as well, right? So, you know, um, at least from the middle period, 12th century, on the career, about 12th, early 13th century, you have texts which say, no, there is no meeting point. The Imams kind of cursed Sufis and attacked Sufis. And that, and those particular texts and motifs then recur in a lot of the anti Sufi material that you have later. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you, even if you look at the analysis of concepts such as Walaya and you compare different kinds of ninth century texts, uh, Shia hadith, uh, uh, other kinds of texts from the broader Shia milieu, uh, um, the works of Hakim Tirmidhi and other kind of early Sufis, uh, the convergence on material is really interesting. And so it begs the question of all, well, where does this come from? Is it um, the Imams influencing Sufis? Is it Sufis influencing the way in which these texts have been um, collated? It's really, it's very difficult to say. Really difficult to say, but but we are talking about historically a very long standing uh, tradition. And as I said, if you asked to Shi Sufi, I think they'd probably say that's the We have we have a couple of questions. The one is, I think, too large for this discussion, but I will I will throw it away, which is what is Shi Sufism as opposed to Su Sunni okay. Sufism? Okay, you may want to deal with this, but let me bring another one, uh, which is more concrete. Um, what is the relationship between Sultan al Shah's commentary and earlier efforts to bring Sufism and Shiism together by figures involved in the name Abdullahi revival? Can, can you repeat? So, uh, what is the relationship between Sultan, Sultan al Shah's commentary on the one hand and the earlier efforts to bring Sufism and Shiism okay. uh, together by figures involved in the name Abdullahi? Revival in the 18th century. He, the, the person is referring to this is Oliver Sharbrot, who's asking the question. Oliver is referring to the poetry of Nur Ali Shah and Muzaffar okay. Ali Shah, and also to the commentary Majba, Majma Al Biha by Muzaffar Ali Shah. Mm -hmm. well, is there a relationship between Sultan Ali Shah and the efforts of these earlier figures? Um, thank you, Oliver, for, for the question. Um, well, it's an interesting one. Um, um, if you're asking about the former relationship, uh, or put in another way, that Sultan Ali Shah mentions them, uh, cite them, uh, the answer would be no. There's no, uh, not to my knowledge. Um, there is also uh, a very evident change undergone in the way 
the uh, Nimatullahia presented itself uh, uh, with the first generation of master who came back from the Deccan and uh, the generation of Sultan Ali Shah. In the middle, you had uh, three masters, well, Hussein Ali Shah in particular, uh, who uh, was a, uh, a cleric, uh, a jurist, uh, and he was, uh, his Sufism was very, very uh, underground. Uh, uh, people in the same, the Hausa in the, in the Madrasa wouldn't even know that he was, uh, that he was a Sufi. Um, and so uh, some sort of change in the, in the self-representation or in the way uh, uh, the order offered itself to the public uh, changed a great deal. So, uh, but of course, yeah, you have the same uh, kind of themes uh, that are, uh, that are uh, touched upon by, uh, by the authors and the masters that, that uh, you mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, make their way into the Tafsir Bayansal. But there's, there is no direct, uh, direct uh, men mention or citation. Okay. Uh, um, if, yeah. if I can bring Professor Saleh again, uh, I just had a question for you, um, if you can uh, hear us. Yes, I hope. Um, which is that um, this is a late 19th century Tafsir. Um, what do I... I wanted to ask you, um, first of all, when, when do you think we can have a comprehensive history of tafsir in the last, let's say, two centuries or two, three centuries? Do you think that's a project that is uh, achievable? And if so, where do you see his shaking his head? Oh, ah, okay. I'm listening. I'm listening. Do you know, um, I'm not sure during COVID, I, I watched all of Frazier, the sitcom, and his, uh, his line is, I'm listening. So um, actually, this is, this is why I think this work is significant, is that unless we have these monograph uh, monographic deep studies mm. of these um, uh, like individuals and Quran commentaries, we're not going to be able to 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 chart the 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 history. And what I love about this work also is the peripheral nature, even in Shiism, that this works have. And who now, um, Sajad, you were the one who introduced me to that book, Intellectual History, where one of them says to write about about the peripheral is to write about profundity. Like in a sense, nothing tells you what something is as a minority inside the tradition. And I think, so like, so we need these things. We need these things to write. As for a general, like it, it will take a while. It will take a while, but also the complexity in, um, okay, the complexity in tafsir is that we still want to treat tafsir not like law in a sense, like nobody thinks of writing a history of Islamic law that like it covers everything, right? But we still think that of tafsir, which is good and bad at the same time. But I think there is a, okay, there is uh, enough justification to write about Sunni development and Shi development. Um, so what we would want is a more comprehensive history of Shia narrative, uh, Shia tafsir narrative, and one more than one of Sunnism. Um, but I'm actually curious to know the the opinion of m both my colleagues on this point. I mean, uh, you wanna. I, I personally think it's impossible uh, for the simple reason that um, you haven't even brought in the complexity of language. There are lots of different languages which are being used. You haven't brought the complexity of media into it. Um, you know, the most popular way that Tafsir is done is on TV and well, it was radio and TV and that's online. Um, 
I'm trying to TikTok is going to get there. It's, it's probably getting there. No, I, I don't, I don't know much about TikTok to be quite honest. But chat GPT, uh, right? Chat so it's yeah. Ask chat GPT. Write a sheet of seed. Write a sheet of seed. No, no, write a sheet of seed. Shall I do it now? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, to be honest, I, I wouldn't expect much from it. But, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I mean, there is that complexity, but what we can certainly do is I think we can come up with kind of broad um, trends that we see, you know, so mm -hmm. in the particular you know, time, what I, what constitutes a of seed of a certain time. And, um, you know, for me, the, the introduction that you translated here is really interesting because I, I worked on a couple of kind of contemporary works, one in Persian, one in Urdu. Uh, and the coverage in the introduction is almost identical. And I think this is actually a modern phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, discussions of Mokkam and Mutashabir and the question yeah. of Tahrif is not modern. But this kind of concern with what the ontology of the Quran is and where the Imams fit in, yeah. etc., is something which is quite rare actually in pre modern Shivas. Mm -hmm. it, it's not explicitly articulated. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so, you know, I compared this with Lavam et Tanzil and with um, Tasar Kitab. So Lavam et Tanzil is a sort of passing this maybe 1910s or so. Tasar um, Kitab uh, is um, Urdu in the 1940s, right? So they they have almost identical concerns, and they also like the kind of the neatness of, of 14 or 12 Muhajimat, right? So this is what's 14 yeah. here. Uh, the Lavama has 12, yeah. of course, um, and the um, uh, Pasuk Kitab has seven, mm -hmm. because these are significant numbers in the yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, um, maybe I'd I, I like to play the devil's advocate here, and uh, I would say that, yeah, you know, I, I, I myself toyed with the idea of doing something along those lines, but, you know, of course, there, there are complexities there. Uh, but it really depends on uh, so what you want to do with such a history. I mean, it's something that you, I mean, uh, Think of a handbook. Uh, yeah, you can possibly. You, you edited the volume approaches to the yeah. Quranic contemporary Iran, yeah. and this was a conference that we held here, and then we published. And then there was lots of discussion on on. Uh, at, there are certain uh, there's a certain period in in the history of Iran in this case, in which the the engagement with the Quran in the madrasas, in the hausa, in literature, in the sea, changes, becomes yeah. more prominent, becomes more central, yeah. right? And so I think that that's why my question to Professor Saleh is, you know, has that have, what are the developments that have happened and what are the different ways and methodologies in yeah. which people are addressing this thing in, in various ways? Uh, such that you know we can we can have a, a more complete view uh, rather than if someone looks at you know the tabaris and the you know the kind of very 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 classical tafsiris that is not going to give you an approach to how Muslims have looked at the Quran right if that is a question that people can ask at all um, but uh, it's good that you have, that you have thought about yeah. doing that. Although Mr. Rizvi has just said it's impossible. So that would be a nice chat there. We have a question in the room. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations for uh, the great work that you have completed. Uh, my question is uh, more uh, on the historical context of the introduction of this FC. Uh, to what extent do you consider this FC by as a response to um, all the attacks by the Shi ulama hmm. in this you know uh, time and, and also consolidation of the the Gunabadi uh, order against the Sabi Shah or the other branch of the Matilal order that wanted to in a way bringing the Gunabadi branch closer and the 
Sherry uh, minded uh, of the old establishment, she establishment basically, and uh, far from the, the other branch, which was more suitable for the people. Thank you for the question. I, I partly answer uh, the question in the, in the book. Uh, um, I don't think that we have reasons to doubt uh, that the uh, immediate intention uh, for writing the tafsir was uh, to put into uh, a book the uh, spiritual uh, intuitions uh, that the Sultan Ali Shah had. Uh, and so he states that, and we don't have the right to say, no, this is just... Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, me getting into the mind of, uh, of the author uh, uh, brought to light uh, uh, the complexity of uh, uh, the very nature of intention whenever uh, anyone writes uh, or does something uh, for that matter. Uh, the intentions are uh, complex, uh, are not always verbalized, uh, are not always uh, uh, able to be rationalized as well. So I think that uh, in a way, this tafsir, beyond being just a tafsir, just beyond being a tafsir, so a, 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 a hermeneutical uh, undertaking, is also a statement, and it, of course, uh, a statement of authority. Uh, it does uh, uh, talk to both uh, the Sufis uh, who are within the Silsila and Sufis who are without the Silsila. It talks to it talks to the uh, to the people in the in the Madrasa, clearly. So if that uh, if you consider that an answer to the um, uh, accusation of uh, illegitimacy of Sufism or uh, the uh, denied right of uh, uh, citizenship, if you want, within the uh, wider 12 Shi community, yes, that is a, a response, that is a, that is a statement. So we are here, we are Sufis, uh, we have the right to be, uh, we are 12 actually we are, uh, uh, if you want, the most uh, authentic uh, 12 Shi'is. Uh, and yeah, in a way, it can be seen uh, as an answer, as a response, but only in this sense that I try to, to, to articulate, not as in, okay, I'm writing tafsir to answer this or that. No, no. But of course, uh, writing a tafsir, writing that in Arabic, uh, combining a lot of the same ideas that the author expressed in, in his other works, yes, it is a form of uh, 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 authority statement, yes. Okay. And, yeah. Well, as we, as we get closer to the, to the closing of, of this uh, launch and discussion, I just wanted to invite uh, each of our panelists to give uh, maybe a final thought on the book. Uh, if we can start with... Um, Professor Lisby, uh, anything that you think may have been left uh, untouched that you think deserves attention? Um, I think we've, we've discussed all of it. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, when it mentioned that particular chapter, you know, she used to keep up and I think that's, that is the core one, you know, what makes this um, um, a she used to keep up is important. Um, um, but uh, uh, you know, for all the different reasons that we've, we've mentioned, I think people really should read it. <laughs> get, get a get a copy at least for the library uh, and make sure you read it because I think I think this is important. Uh, um, you know, it, it's it is the case that she, the study of sheep of seed is is neglected mm. um, for the uh, you know for the reasons that we know that the fact that the study of Islam is basically. Uh, not the study of Islam, it's the study of Sunni Islam. Um, and so, uh, you know, we need more things which are uh, which deal with that. And as, uh, you know, well, you mentioned this thing, really interesting, that at the same time, you have, uh, you know, the tafsir about Fayyish and, and others coming out from the Ibadi tradition. Um, there is something to be said about looking at this alongside the emergence of 
maybe not modern, but sort of more recent in time, the emergence of the tradition as it's seen in different contexts, where you don't have any ambiguities in the vacation. I think um, there is no ambiguity in this text. It's, it's, it's creative statement at the beginning of the introduction is very, very explicit. Um, not only is it for the she, it's actually pinning its its uh, a sort of colors to a particular, what I would call maximalist, immunological uh, conception. Uh, well, it's a quinia is at the heart of it. That's what the Valai Khan is. And, and then that's then what, you know, becomes contested. Later. Mm -hmm. So you do have the Fasiyas more recently, which would really attack that mm -hmm. conception of, of Walai as being, um, at the very least, some sort of exaggeration, or potentially, you know, should even, you know, which is a very um, problematic thing to, to do anyone of them in some context. Um, and so it's also interesting to see if, if there would be similar kinds of developments in uh, Ibadis and kinds of Sunni uh, Tafsi uh, where there is a very um, clear kind of identification of what the tradition is, where do those boundaries lie, boundaries lie in, and how it kind of be similar to the social boundaries. Thank you. Before we give you the last word, let me go to Professor Saleh. Any last thoughts on this project, on this book, on this publication, this author? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, just let, let me add this, like, we need this attention to Shia works. I mean, and like, really, uh, so I really think this is this is going to change the debate, and this is going to, uh, it's going to become essential read for, like, you know, what we call modern developments, although this is in the classical mode, but like in a sense to go back to like it, its modernity is it's written in in our times, even if it uses scholastic uh, language. Or what I'm saying is scholastic language talking now is different than scholastic language talking back then. And the 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 the, the profundity of this is that it took that seriously and gave it uh, like a presence. So I'm, I'm I really want to congratulate Alessandro. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, kind words. Uh, well, the last thought would be, uh, I don't know, perhaps uh, I really hope uh, uh, to, it's early to say, but uh, to have put uh, pistas here in the, on the map. Uh, and, you know, my only uh, aspiration would be that, uh, you know, the, even a little change in the in the uh, uh, in the scholarship on on Tafsir uh, that would be a huge achievement for me. Uh, so uh, read the book, uh, read the list introduction, and yeah, uh, and yeah, that, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Really. Thank you very much. I think, you, I think you have managed to, to put the map, uh, to put the, the, the tafsir on the map and Sultan of the Shabon as well. So congratulations on, on that great achievement. Um, to all those people out there who have who teach courses uh, and have bibliographies for September, please include this book in your bibliographies. That will give us uh, lots of brownies uh, around here. Uh, no, seriously, I mean, this is, this is something that we, we really need to bring to um, uh, uh, Quranic studies courses, Shi studies courses, uh, Iran uh, courses, modern, modern Islam courses. It's really a book that speaks to all these fields. So please uh, request the book for your libraries, buy the book, uh, and include them in your bibliographies. Um, one last thought uh, from me. Uh, I thank uh, the, the audience and I thank all the participants and the panelists, especially uh, people who have. Uh, Helped us okay. organize uh, all of this. Um, it's been a fantastic event. It wasn't and easy to get the room. Uh, it was easy. Either, yeah. It was easy. I must say that uh, when you look at manuscripts, um, the uh, uh, if you're lucky and you find uh, a manuscript with a colophon where the scribe writes his or her name, um, uh, typically you would find the person's name, and before the person's name, you would find some kind of signs of humility and person would say, you know, Anna al faqir or al faqir or something like that. And um, I see Alessandro Kanchan really as, as a very humble 
scholar who uh, does not like to talk about himself and does not like to kind of publicize his work. Um, and I even struggled to, to bring in his, his bio into the, into the book and his previous publications, but I had to insist. Uh, so there is a kind of humble, almost, you know, supi like attitude, which is appreciated in a scholar. Um, and um, in, in the manuscript tradition, you would also write the, the, the date and the month in which you uh, finish the copy. And so it is considered very auspicious if you finish your, your manuscript uh, in the month of Ramadan, especially the last days of Ramadan. And because it is, we are in the last days of Ramadan, then I think this is a very auspicious publication. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, and I hope to see you again in another uh, event here at the IAS at the Agri Center. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.